Atonement day, a shepherd cries, another spotless lamb must die. Oh, how could just one sacrifice our God Jehovah satisfy? Year after year the blood would flow, but none could wash me white as snow. Salvation's day fulfilled the plan. The promise came, one holy lamb, one holy lamb, wash my sin away. One sacrifice paid a price I could not pay. One holy lamb, one great I am. our sins away. Amen? Praise God for that. Brother Sasser, why don't you make your way up here? This is Brother John Sasser, and um, as, I, as you heard me earlier, certainly, definitely, if not the best speaker I've heard when it comes to um, a lot of this stuff with all the um, Jewish Old Testament laws and everything, it's amazing. The first time I heard him, I was like, there's somebody that knows what he's talking about. Amen. I've been, you know, over the years, you know, over 26 years as a pastor, you run across different people over time and um, not taking anything away from them. But I, it, I was impressed the first time I heard Brother Sasser. And I praise God, was able to have him come in. We support him as well. And we want to um, learn from him. So open your ears, your hearts. Let's see what God has for us here this morning. Amen. Thank you, preacher, for setting that bar so high. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I hope I can achieve that and uh, but thank you pastor i appreciate you having us come out and uh, certainly our desire this week is to be a blessing for you folks and to help you uh, grow in in the knowledge and grace of our lord and savior jesus christ appreciate that song what a lovely song i'm glad my sins are gone and i remember uh the area we live in in israel uh, just below us there's a little park it's called dog park and it means fish park and uh right around rosh hashanah the feast of trumpets You'll see uh, a lot of the Orthodox communities, a lot of Hasidic Jews around us, you'll see them just gathered around that little pond. And I mean, it's just, there'll be a couple of hundred gathered around it and they're taking bread crumbs and they're taking pieces of bread and they're throwing it in the water. And this is called tashlik. And they throw those bread crumbs in the water and the fish will come up and eat the bread. And it's symbolic of their sins being carried into the depth of the sea. But you know, I'm glad my... Sins aren't in the depth of the sea. No fish came and grabbed it and took it away. My sins are gone. They're underneath the blood. They're not as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. My sins are gone. When Christ died, he paid the price. Amen. And my sins are gone. Amen. And I am so grateful for that. Praise the Lord. Got your Bibles. Turn it over to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 25. And as Pastor mentioned, we'll be looking at the Jewish roots of Christianity. And 
uh, mentioned in the Sunday school hour, there's actually um, um, there's actually movements out there called the Jewish Roots Movement, and these are false uh, teachings. There's false, a uh, lot of false teachings regarding this, and we hope by the grace of God we can put some things in perspective. And, uh, and, a, and a right understanding of what the Bible has to say. Now today we're going to be looking at a little bit different of a subject. It'll kind of tie in with that of the Passover tonight. And again, you do not want to miss that Passover Seder. Uh, we'll be setting up tables and each person is going to have a, ta- a plate before them. A, a, uh, uh, it'll be a plastic plate of a Passover Seder. You're going to have each of the items uh, that will be used in the Seder plate at your, at your possession. And uh, we'll kind of demonstrate it, and you'll get to go through and try it as, as we go through and talk about it. I remember I had an Orthodox Jew that got saved one time, and he came to church, and, and he's sitting there, and he's watching one of the, the first Passover demonstrations we did there in Baltimore. And uh, he sat there, and he told me afterwards, he says, you've got to be kidding me. He said, you mean I've done this every year of my life, and I had no idea it pointed to Jesus. He said, it's so obvious. And I've heard that numerous times from Jewish people who came to faith in the Lord. And so tonight we'll look at that. Matthew chapter number 25, you got your Bible, invite you to stand if you're able to. Pastor, you ain't got to, but if you're able to stand in reverence of the Word of God, uh, just invite you to stand. Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, and he said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Father, we love you, and we're so grateful for the privilege we have this morning to be able to gather here. And I pray that today that you would be glorified and, and honored in our midst today. I pray that everything that's said and done would, would uh, Lord, be pre- pleasing in your, in your sight today. I pray that there's one today that's never been born again. And Lord, we ask that the Holy Ghost of God would speak to their hearts and convict them and I pray that you would draw them by your marvelous grace and save them by your, your mercy. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would encourage and challenge your people today. We'll thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Now, Matthew chapter number 25 is going through and he's laying a setting that's going to be referred to as the judgment of the nations. And, and so he's using an illustration of an ancient wedding uh, to illustrate these truths, how five were wise and five were unwise. Five were ready, five were not ready. And what's going to be taking place, as you'll find in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31, he says, when the Son of Man c- uh, shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this is referring to the judgment of the nations. And what's going to happen? I know y'all have been going through prophecy, I was told on on several Wednesday nights, and of course uh, you're familiar, then the next event that's going to happen is going to be the rapture of the church. It is going to start a seven-year period, a tribulation period. It's going to last seven years. During that seven-year period, the judgments of God are going to be unfolded upon this earth like never before. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus goes through and he details the events that will transpire during that seven-year period. And during that time, Jesus said it'll be a time like never has been upon the face of this earth. At the end of that tribulation period, Jesus himself will come back to this earth 
and he will reign on the throne of David for 1,000 years in what we call the millennial reign. That is the judgment of the nations. It takes place right before that millennial reign. Those that are left will be able to go in and, and literally go right into that millennial reign. There will be others that will be taken away and taken into judgment. And that's what Jesus was laying the setting for back in Matthew chapter number 24. When he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two be in the field, one taken, another left. Sounds like the rapture, don't it? But it ain't. That's talking about this judgment that's going to be happening. Uh, two be grinding at the meal, one taken, another left. Again, that's not the rapture of the church. Because that's during the tribulation period. But this is something that's going to happen at the end of that tribulation period. And Jesus gives us two illustrations here. One, the first parable he gives is right here and it is that of the bridegroom. And that's where I want to pick up and look at this morning. And I want to, I gave you the context of what's taking place because I'm going to do something that I hate to do. And I'm going to take something out of context. And so I'm going to take this passage today and I want to use it as an illustration. Because the context you see is dealing with the judgment of the nations. But I want to take and look at a subject that's referred to as the ancient Jewish wedding. And I want to look at that because here it gives us an illustration. Now understand throughout the Bible, many times the, a wedding or uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife is paralleled in many ways. Jesus used the relationship between a husband and a wife and he parallels it between the relationship between Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so I want to kind of use the same type of parallel and I want to look at this subject on the ancient Jewish weddings. Now, first of all, understand that there are three aspects to it you need to understand. First, there is the betrothal period. The betrothal period. Then you have got the wedding period. And then thirdly, you're going to have the celebration period. So that's basically my outline. Now, when you look at the betrothal period, understand that betrothal uh, during biblical days is not like how it was today. Now, today, people date and so forth. They didn't quite have that type of system back in biblical days. Now, the betrothal period could last one to two years. It could last a lot longer than that. But it had to be at least one year period before the wedding would take place. And so, and, and so, but it could be a lot longer, all depending on whether or not if that marriage was prearranged uh, be beforehand or not. But now, what will take place, let me just kind of give you an illustration. Just say there was a guy, say he goes down to the shook, the market. And he's down at the market, and he's maybe buying some stuff, and he looks over, and he sees this young lady, and he thinks, wow, she's it. I mean, she is the girl that I want to spend the rest of my life with. I, and if a man was to do something like that, what he would do is he would go home and he would draw up a contract. Within Judaism today, they have what they call a ketubah. And it is a written formal contract. And this contract would go through, uh, back in those days, it would go through and state several things. A few of those things would be uh, his willingness to provide for the young woman. You see, he is promising to take care of this woman. Understand, this girl would know exactly what she would be getting into. And so it would contain, uh, it would contain several items, his willingness to provide for her. It would give a description of the whole marriage process. She knew what she was getting into. And it would also contain a price in which this young man is willing to pay for this young lady. So he would go home and draw up this contract. He would bring it back to the father's house and he would sit down with her, her and her father and he would present this contract to her. Now, they could either accept it or could reject it. If she rejected that contract, uh, then she would just turn away from it. If she accepted it, she would actually take a cup and they would seal that, uh, that arrangement with the drinking of a cup uh, from the fruit of the vine. Now, understand when you, when you look at this, the reason uh, those things are listed in there, again, he's promised to provide for uh, he, he, the, the bride price that he's willing to pay for this young lady. It is a lot of money. I mean, it ain't like uh, just some nickel and dime stuff. I mean, it's a lot of money. You see, th they likened it in what some commentaries that I read regarding it, they would liken it to almost like putting a down payment on a house. I mean, it's a lot of money. I mean, to get married, to have a wife, it's going to cost you a lot of money. You men that's married, you can say amen to that right there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's expensive. That's why only the wealthy could have more than one wife's. 
Uh, and, and so you could only see the wealthy in the Bible that had more than one. They couldn't own, the poor people couldn't afford more than one. And so you'd have to, uh, you'd, you'd provide this great price and willing to pay for this young lady. Now the reason the price is, is so high was twofold. Number one, it was to compensate the father. It was to compensate the father uh, for having a daughter instead of having a son. You go back and you study through your Bible, you'll see how to have a son was something of great honor because he carried the name, he carried uh, the possessions of the home, and it continued on. But to have a daughter, she would move away uh, from the father's house once she got married, so you're going to be losing that. And so it's to compensate the father for having a daughter instead of having a son. Number two, it was to demonstrate his seriousness. You see, it was to demonstrate his love for this young lady. He was committed to her. He was willing to pay this amount of money to prove that he was serious about getting into it. People go into marriage completely wrong today. Pastor said they just had a wedding uh, uh, here. And, and, you know, people enter into marriage with the wrong concept. They enter this concept like, well, if it don't work, we'll just get a divorce. That should never be in the thought of a person going into a marriage. You go, I, I, I've counseled with couples getting ready to get married, and I, I'll tell them the odds are against you. Because in our society, we tell them, if it don't work, just get out of it. You start over again. Instead of being committed to it through the tough times, through the, through the good times, of uh, being committed and staying faithful through the midst of it. And, and, and so uh, when you look at this, it's to demonstrate this man's seriousness and his love towards her. Can you only imagine over 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ taking upon himself a body? For what purpose? That he might get a bride. You see, he sought after a bride. He came and he was willing to give his life. Matter of fact, the Bible says it this way in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He says that in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He says it in, uh, in 1 Peter 1 and 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He said it this way in Acts 20 and 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And so he purchased us with his own blood. He says it in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, could you imagine here he's telling us that we are his purchased possession. We've been bought with a price. And because we've been bought with a price, we should glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. The other day we took my, my one son, wanted to get him a new truck. And so we took him up to a, a dealership and he bought a 2015 F-150. Unbelievable how much the vehicles cost. It's just mind boggling. Some of those trucks, I mean, they cost more than my first house I bought. I mean, it's just insane to me how much vehicles cost. And that's what we have to pay. I mean, that's what the market is. But he's in there and he buys this truck. I mean, this thing is, is boy, it's beautiful, beautiful truck, beautiful tires, beautiful wheels. And boy, Chris said, he said, man, when I pulled in that parking lot, he said, it almost looked like that truck winked at me. He goes, my goodness. He said, boy, we test drove that thing. He's like, yeah, I'm ready for it. I mean, he saved his money. He's got a lot of money saved up and working hard. And, and I said, all right, is that what you want? He's, and boy, he's sitting there just kind of debating over it. He, he's about to put a deposit down. Uh, and he's like, boy, you know, when I commit to this, I'm committed. You know, I mean, he was, he, he was realizing that. And I said, once you put that 500 down, you ain't getting it back. I said, it's over then. I said, that $40,000 almost for this truck this is going to cost you. I said, your life is going to be locked in for the next five years. And I said, you better make sure before you sign that check over. And boy, he sat there and, and kind of tumbled back and forth and finally signed it and, and went through all the paperwork, finally got everything done. And, and we went to get that truck. Now, could you imagine sitting there like he did? And, and he had never signed his name so much in all his life as he's sitting there just signing and signing and signing. But could you imagine uh, after all that signing, sitting there for an hour, two hours, sitting inside the car dealership and then walking out and going over to that new truck that he's getting and gets in? and he goes to start it up and nothing happens 
Could you imagine how it have felt? See, that's what would have happened to me. But you, could you imagine doing that? And then you're getting out and saying, you know, what's wrong with the truck? And you pop the hood, and while you were in there signing your life away, somebody done come stole the motor out? How would you feel? You'd feel ripped off because you didn't get everything you paid for. Well, can I ask you, how do you think the Lord feels? We've been bought with a price, and we're not giving him all of our life. We'll tell the Lord, you know, I, I, I can give you Sunday morning. I can give you Sunday night. I'll give you this area of my life or that area of my life, but not giving me in all of your life. I'm telling you, we've been bought with a price. And the Bible says because we've been bought with a price, we should glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are whose? Which are God's. We are his purchased possession. And that price has been set. The price has been given. And can I say no man has ever met the price that Jesus was willing to pay for you and I. For him going to the cross and giving his life, no man could match the price that he was willing to pay for you and I. And so here we find he's offering this. And of course... We find the second aspect, once he, once he would present this offer, again, that young lady would, and her father would take that cup and drink of that cup, and when they did, it sealed the deal. I mean, it was now set in, in, in stone, and it was already committed, and, and it entered into a betrothal period. And that betrothal period, as I mentioned, would last at least one to two years. And so, uh, and again, it all depends on how long the marriage might have been prearranged if it was. If you remember in Matthew chapter number 27 and or 26 in verse number 27 he says this and he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins we'll look at that cup tonight as we go through the Passover celebration but then we find the consolation because here uh, the young man after they seal the deal he will then console the young lady by giving her gifts and he will give her gifts to help her during this betrothal period. And, and, and these gifts are designed for that purpose to help her during it. You see, the Bible tells us uh, in, first, in, in 1 John 4 and verse number 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us. Why? Because he hath given us of his spirit. So the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit. He says it in John 14 and 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you, and my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now I want you to notice four things about what he was saying in those verses about the gift that he gave us. First of all, the Holy Spirit, he would bring comfort comfort and that was the the purpose you see that betrothal period can be a long discouraging time but you know what he did he gave us a gift to help us during that long uh discouraging betrothal period in which we're in and and so the bible tells us let us not be weary in in, in well-doing for we shall reap if we faint not and so he is to bring comfort to us but secondly he is to bring instruction to us he said, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom my Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. You see, the Holy Spirit is to instruct us. He is to teach us. He is to guide us into all truth. But he's to bring remembrance. He says it this way, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You see, he will not allow us to forget the one that bought us. Well, I'm telling you, when I got saved April 6, 1997, my life drastically changed. And at that moment in time, I didn't know everything that happened to me, but I do know one thing that happened. The Holy Spirit of God moved in within me. And there was something within me that motivated me, that taught me, that instructed me, that guided me, that encouraged me. And I'm telling you, that was the Spirit of God that lives within. And if you're here this morning and you're saved by the grace of God, you've got that same Holy Ghost living inside you as well. Well, he would bring remembrance but then fourthly he would bring peace you see he says there peace I leave with you my peace I give unto you not as the world give us he would give peace you see there's no need of being afraid of losing the bridegroom I remember I was working uh, I was working this job and I just got saved I remember walking in and this guy he was a he was a Methodist and I'd go and I'd talk to him sometimes and now I just gotten saved and I walked in one day and he he told me he goes he goes how are you this morning John I said man I'm so saved this morning I could swing over hell on a rotten corn stalk and go to heaven and he goes, oh, I wouldn't say that and I'm like oh listen you don't understand I said I'm not I'm not holding on to him 
I said, he's holding on to me. I said, I've been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood. I'm telling you, I've got peace with God. I've got an assurance with God. Why? Because he gave us the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, there's no fear in my heart of losing the bridegroom. Why? Because he gave me his spirit. Well, I tell you, my wife, when I remember when we got engaged, I gave her a, 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 an engagement ring. And there might have been times she was sitting there and she might have been, she was in college at the time, she might have been sitting there in school or sitting at work and, and she might have been sitting there going, you know, I wonder if he really is serious. I wonder if he really loves me. I wonder if he's really committed to me. All she had to do was look down on her finger and say, oh yeah, I know he is. I mean, you see, it gave her an assurance. And that's what giving those gifts, the gifts that he gave, would ensure her and help her during that period of time. He gave us the Holy Spirit. But secondly, he gave us the Scriptures. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119 and verse number 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How does he do it? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You see, by taking heed according to the word of God, which is a gift of God. You see, God gave us that Bible to what? To help us to get ready for the bridegroom. It prepares us. It'll mold us. It'll make us. The more you get into that Bible and the more that Bible gets into you, the more it'll mold you and shape you and getting you ready for the bridegroom to come. Or for, the, uh, for, for him to come. Then we see uh, the building. See, what would take place as the young man would then give her these gifts? He would go back to his father's house and he would build what they call a, kind of like a little mansion on the side of his father's house. He would go back and get things ready for the wedding to take place. So he would have a lot of work to be done in, in preparation for this. Remember Jesus tells his disciples in John 14 in verse number 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. At where I am there you may be also. Uh, as a matter of fact, the young man, you see, it wasn't his job to determine whether or not the house was ready. It was his father's. You see, if it had been me, I'd just went over and thrown a lean-to up or something like that and we'd be good to go. Uh-uh. You see, that's why it wasn't up to the son. It was up to the father to determine when it was ready. And then he would tell his son, okay, everything's ready. Go get your, go get your bride. And that's why the Bible tells us in Mark 13 and, and, and in other places that no man knoweth the day or the hour. Not the son, not the angels, only the father knoweth the day of the hour. Nobody knows that day. If people stand up and tell you this is the day that Jesus is coming back, you just mark it down. It ain't going to happen that day. I guarantee you. Why? Because Jesus said no man knoweth the day nor the hour. But you know what happens every year around September, around the Feast of Trumpets? Every year there's people out there saying Jesus is coming this year on the Feast of Trumpets. Every year you hear this happening. And you know what? He never does. He never does. You see, date setters are always upsetters. You mark that down. They're always, they're, they're going to be wrong. Nobody knows the day or the hour. You're not going to get some hidden meanings in the scriptures by counting every third letter and adding it up to come calculate some certain time and date that this event's going to happen. Listen, all things, the scriptures are given for our learning, for our understanding. And God's not hid those things to us. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belongeth to the Lord our God. But those things that he's revealed, he's revealed to us and to our children. You know what that verse tells you? Everything God wants you to know, he tells you in the Bible. And if he don't want you to know it, you ain't going to know it. But everything he does want us to know is found written in the pages of the Word of God. He's not hidden stuff in there. He wants us to search and understand the, 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 the mysteries, the truths of the Word of God. But there's no hidden, hidden uh, meanings in this Kabbalistic tiles of teachings throughout the Word of God. That stuff is wrong and it's dangerous to get into. But he gave us the Word of God to mold us and make us like Christ. But then we see uh, the, as he begins to build this bridal chamber, once it's, it's ready, you see, understand, he's back there working, getting things ready. But that lady's got responsibilities. She's got responsibilities as well because it's a time of purity. That's why the betrothal period had to last at least one to two years. It is to make sure that this young lady is pure, that she's not with child already during this time frame. It's to make sure she's pure. 
Matter of fact, it was during this time period that we see that Joseph looked to put Mary away privately. It was during this period of time that Moses gave that, uh, uh, that law of divorcement. It was during the betrothal period. And so it was a very legal binding time. And Ephesians 5 and 26 tells us that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. And then he says this, so ought men to love their wives. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. And so it's a time of purity. It's a time of, uh, 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 of, of getting our hearts, our lives closer to the Lord, growing in God's grace and knowledge. It's a time of cleansing. It is during this time she'll go through a mikvah. And a mikvah is a baptism pool. It's exactly what it was. Now, baptisms didn't start with John the Baptist, contrary to a, a lot of beliefs. Baptisms goes all the way back to the law of Moses. They would baptize people. They would submerge them. The priests would be washed in water. You can go through a lot of the antiquity sites throughout Israel, and you'll find ancient baptismal sites. I'm talking about 2,000, 3,000, 3,500 years old, some of these sites. And you'll see these ancient baptismal sites. There's steps just like this that goes down into a pool where they would go down and be submerged in water. So she would go through a mikvah. I remember I saw this place right next to that little that fish park I was telling you about. It was a, an old, I mean, it was a rough-looking building. It had spray paint all over it. And I keep seeing all these ultra-Orthodox Jews going in this building. And, and I finally asked this Arab friend of mine, I said, what is that place? And he goes, oh, that's it. That's it. And he's trying to say it in English. He didn't know how to say it to me in English. He says, that's that dirty water place. I said, that what? He said, that dirty water place. I said, what are you talking? He said, dirty water. And that's all he would say. And I'm like, I still couldn't figure it. Finally, I said, I'm just going to walk in there. So I walked in there one day, and it was a mikvah. It was like a big pool in there. And, and these Orthodox men, every week, would come up there, and they would get baptized. They would be submerged in water. And uh, right before the Shabbat starts, the Sabbath starts, they would go in there and, and get uh, ceremonially cleansed, getting ready for the Sabbath day. And so uh, that's, that's what he was talking about, that dirty water place. And so uh, you'll see these mikvahs, but it's a time of cleansing. Thirdly, you'll find it's a, it's a time of preparation because it's a time that she's, she's getting herself ready to meet the bridegroom. You see her life now, now that she's betrothed, her life now is, is, is not about living for the world, but her life now is focused on one thing, and it's getting ready for that wedding day. That's what she's centering on. That's what her life is all about is preparing and getting ready for that day to take place. And so uh, when we read throughout the Word of God, it is still a time of uh, what happens when a person gets saved. What's the next step? It's to get baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. It identifies you. And that's the next step for a believer to take place. And what happens after, after baptism? What do we do? We, we start growing in the grace and knowledge of God. We should, be, we should be learning more about our Bibles, coming to church, uh, feasting on the Word of God, getting fed from the Bible, and, and growing in God's grace and knowledge, getting ready to meet the bridegroom. But it's also a time of proclamation. You see, she'd go out and tell everybody, have you heard? Have you heard? I'm getting married. Now, my wife, it's amazing. Ladies can do this, and you men will, will understand what I'm saying when I say this. It's amazing how a lady can walk into a room, just got engaged, and she walks into a room, don't even have to say nothing, and other ladies spot the ring on their finger. I mean, it's just fascinating. I've watched it. I've watched it for years. I've watched, I've watched people walk into it. Maybe it's because they're walking like this. I don't know. But, I mean, I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, they spot that ring right off the bat, and they go, oh, they go crazy over that thing. You see, she's telling everybody she's getting married. And you see, as a believer, we should be doing likewise. We should be telling others about the big day. We should be going out and proclaiming and telling others, inviting them to come in, uh, trying to get out into the world. Why? Because we want others to be there as well. But then we find that that bride, she lives in anticipation because she don't know the day. She don't know the hour. She don't know when it's going to happen. She just knows one thing it's going to happen. 
And she has to constantly be ready. And that's the picture he's painting in Matthew 25 about the woman being prepared. She's got oil in her lamps. She's ready. And at midnight, the cry comes. And at midnight, here he comes to get his bride. I, I remember when we first, uh, first time in Israel, I think it was the first night or two we were there. And we were, we were, we were, where we were staying at, we were staying in the backyard of, a, of an Israeli friend of ours house. And they had two little apartments out there. And my wife and I was in one and our kids were in the other and they were a adjacent to each other but you had to go outside to get to it and uh and so I remember laying in bed and I hear all these explosions going off and I'm thinking what in the world is that and we're right on the Lebanon Syria border I mean Kiryat Shimona got hit in 2006 with 450 rockets from Lebanon I mean we're five miles from Lebanon if that Syria is just on the other side of Mount Hermon from us I mean it's, we're right there at it I'm thinking rockets I'm thinking rockets. I go running outside, and I'm looking up. I'm looking up on the mountains. I don't see nothing happening. I don't see no missiles. And I go check on the kids. They're fine. Next day, I hear the same thing at night. And that time, I turned around. I looked, and I saw fireworks off in the background. What it was it was a wedding, and that happened for eight days. They celebrated this, and it was a huge celebration. But you see, before that celebration, there's going to be the catching away of that bride, and she would have to live in anticipation, not knowing when it was going to be just knowing that it was going to happen. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, because, you see, she, he could come at any moment. And they said a lot of times back in those days that the man would come and he would take a shofar and he would blow that shofar and they would, they would be a, a loud shout of excitement and they, he would rush into the house and grab up his bride and get his bride. Now the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead... It some of your faces. I'm telling you, listen, one day that trumpet is going to sound and the Lord is going to descend and when he does, he is coming to snatch his bride away. I'm going to grab my bride and bring her up here. She had to sit way in the back. She's done that on purpose. Amen. You ought to see the first time I preached this message. She thought, what are you doing dragging me up here? <laughs> but you should say, I need to set a camera up here to see y'all's faces one time when, I, when she blows that horn. And so you don't run away, bride. Stay right there. And so he would run back uh, and get his bride and bring her back to the father's house. And that's where the wedding would be. Now, this is a talit. This is a prayer shawl. Now, uh, they will stand today. They stand under what they call a kupa. And uh, the kupa is, is, is like a prayer shawl that they'll stand under. Now, understand these prayer shawls. Now, these do not go back to Jesus' day. Jesus did not wear a prayer shawl. The prayer shawls did not start until after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. You see, they had no temple. That's why you see Orthodox Jews, when they go to pray in the morning, they cover this over their head. Why? This is their temple. This is their place of prayer. And so it started after the destruction of the temple. Pre-destruction of the temple, they had what the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy call fringes on the corners of their garments. So on the outer corners of the, uh, corners of the garments, you would put fringes on it. And God said that when you look upon them, you're to remember to obey the word of God. And so these fringes represent the commandments of God. And so they would stand underneath it. They'd stand underneath that kupa, and they'll go through that whole wedding process. Now, understand, these fringes represent, uh, there's 13 different knots tied on these fringes. And the, the numeric value of six uh, of, of these 13 knots and the Hebrew word talit, you take the numeric value and add it up, it comes up to 613. That's why they got 13 knots, 613. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. And so when a Jew wears these talits, they're to re be reminded of their obedience to keep the word of God. Now, when you're standing under this, it's to remind you that your home must be built on the foundation of the word of God. The blue and the gold is supposed to represent God and, and heaven. Oliver Green said this. He said that our home should be a picture of heaven. And it should be. It shouldn't be a war zone. It should be a picture of heaven. That's what our home should look like, and it can. I remember we did some uh, marriage seminars in Israel, and, and I remember we had this, this uh, Orthodox rabbi and his wife come in, and he was trying to stop it, and she sat down, and I, I took my text out of the book of Exodus where they came to the place called Mara. Mara in Hebrew means bitter. And just down the road from Mara was a place called Elam. Elam means joy. 
And I made this statement. I said, now your home could either be a picture of Mara, bitterness, or it could be a picture of Elam, joy. And I said, the choice is yours. And I was, I'm going to show you how you can have joy and not bitterness. And so the rabbi got mad and yelling at his wife. And he said, let's go. And she said, I want to hear this. And I thought, oh, my boy, he got bad then. But anyway, he drug his wife out. But, but, but you see, your homes can be that way. It don't have to be horrible. It doesn't have to be a battle zone. It can be a piece of heaven. And that's how it should be. But here they are. They're standing under that kuppa. And they're getting ready to go through that wedding process. I'm going to let my bride go sit back down here. I'll let you take this with you. And so they stand underneath that chuppah as they go through the wedding process. Now, after the wedding takes place, then they're going to go through and they're going to, uh, it's, going to, it's going to start the celebration period. Now, when we think about the, the wedding and the, and, and, and the things that are taking place, you know, after the ceremony, they're going to enter into the chamber. The best man will stand at the door waiting on the marriage to be consummated. He is going to announce back to the guests that are there that the marriage is now complete and consummated. That starts the celebration period. Now, during that celebration period, uh, uh, again, that best man, you say, who's uh, in, in the best man? Well, that's pretty, pretty pretty obvious that, you know, in John chapter number three, John the Baptist says he's the best man. You say, he says that? Oh yeah, yeah, he said it. He said this in John three and verse 28, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath a bride is the bridegroom. He said, that's Christ. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. So he said he was the best man. So uh, he was the forerunner. And that's what he was saying. So he'd stand there and announce that. And so then it would, it would, it would start this, now this celebration period. Now understand that wedding chamber. Uh, I mean, this is a place now, understand that she, the bride and the bridegroom are going to see themselves for who they really are. They're not hiding behind jewelry anymore or, or any facade. It's going, to be, it's going to be real. They're going to see themselves for who they really are. You know, the Bible tells us that, that, that for other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And so that's speaking of the judgment seat of Christ. And that's the picture that it's painting there. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And we're all standing before. If you're here this morning and you've been saved by the grace of God, one day you're going to stand before him and you're going to have to give an account for what you did in this body. And so that's the picture that he's painting. Now that's, again, that celebration period is going to last seven days. In many cultures over there, it lasts for eight days. And I mean, uh, in the Arab culture, I ain't never seen nothing like it. I mean, they celebrate seven days of feasting. Our landlord's daughter got, uh, our neighbor, his daughter got married and they spent almost $30,000 on the food. That's the food. They eat for seven days. I, and they, 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 it, the music is unbelievably loud. I mean, all night long. Thank God my kid's bedroom was a bomb shelter. It's got 14-inch thick concrete walls and steel doors and steel shutters. We shut it all and had to move everybody in that bed because you couldn't sleep. The noise is so loud. They're eating and dancing and celebrating all, I mean, till 2, 3 in the morning, every single night. That's the, that's the bride's family. The groom's family does the same thing for seven days at his family. They only meet together and celebrate one time during the midst of that seven days. I ain't never seen nothing like it. It's, it's a huge celebration period of time. Can you imagine what it's going to be in heaven? I mean, if they celebrate like this on the earth, what's it going to be like in heaven when the bride and uh, the bridegroom meet and the marriage begins to take place? She said, it's going to be a huge supper. We have a banquet that's going to be there. All the Old Testament saints will be gathered there. The Bible says in Revelation 19, 9, He saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. He's talking about those who are called to the marriage. You don't call the bride to the marriage. You call guests, and they were the guests. There's the departure for home. Once the festive meal is over, what the man will do, he'll take his wife. When all everything's done, he's going to go back to his house. Remember, he just built that place on the side of his father's house. He's going back to his house. 
What's going to happen at the end of that tribulation period? During that tribulation period, these events are going to be ha happening here on earth. All these judgments is going to be unfolding on this earth. But up in heaven, there's going to be a wedding taking place. And at the end of that tribulation period, when Jesus comes back, he's leaving heaven. He's coming back to this earth and his feet will stand on this earth. He is going to live on this earth for a thousand years and reign in what we call the millennial reign. And you say, what are we going to do? We're coming back with him, according to Revelation. We're coming back to this earth with him. We're going to be, uh, we're going to, Revelation 19, 14 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it should he smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. I'm telling you, listen, he's coming back to this earth. And if you're not saved, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, then I'm going to tell you, listen, that, that grand way wedding that's, that we're talking about, you're not going to be a part of it. But you're going to be a part of the judgments that will be unfolding upon this earth if Christ was to come back and you were alive during that time frame. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, can I tell you, listen, you need to get born again. Time is running out. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what another day holds. You better be ready. You better be ready. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, can I invite you that cup has been poured and it's been offered. All you've got to do is receive it. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you're willing to repent, turn from your sin, and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be a part of that bride. You can be born again. You can have life eternal. But if you reject it, my friend, it's a life, Jesus said, like this world has never ever seen before the judgments that they're going to have to go through but he's offering that cup and the invitation is not just for one it's for all it's for whosoever will i'm glad he tasted death for every man and would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth christ died for everybody but if you're here this morning and you have been saved are you giving your body as a living sacrifice does he have all of your life or does he just have a little bit of your life? You've been bought with a price. Are you glorifying God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's? Or are you just saying, Lord, here, you can have this key of my life. I'll give you, I'll give you this, this area of my life, but I'm not going to give you the other area. Maybe today you just need to say, Lord, here is my life. Whatever you want for it, I'm willing to give it. Why? Because you gave your life for me. Here's mine in return. Just surrender your life to him. As every head's bowed and every eye closed, as we begin to close this service, maybe God is speaking to your heart this morning. Maybe you need to come down and get on this altar this morning and say, Lord, here's my life. Take my life. Whatever you want from it, it's yours. I've been bought with a price. Maybe you're here this morning and no one's looking around. I want to say, and you say, preacher, I know that I've been saved. I know I'm born again. I know I am. If you know you're saved this morning, could you just lift your hands up real quickly and put it right back down? I see hands going up all over the place. But I saw some, there's no hands going up. Maybe you're here today and you'll say, preacher, I know I'm not saved. I know that if I died, heaven wouldn't be my home. Pray for me. Maybe you're like that this morning. Just slip your hand up real quick and put it down. I'm not going to embarrass you. I wouldn't come to you. I want to pray for you. Anyone like that? I'm not sure. Pray for me. Just being honest. Slip your hand up and put it right back down. Anyone? Anyone? That's the most important thing in life. You realize that? You miss heaven. You miss it all. You got one shot at this life. One shot. One shot. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only way. But he said there was some, they said, you, he said, you might not come to me that you might have life. There's some maybe even here this morning, you just, you're resisting, you're holding back. I'm telling you, it's the best thing you'll ever do. He is the way. He's the only way. Say, I'm just not sure. Pray for me. Anybody, anybody like that? Maybe you're here this morning, you're saved. Does he have all of your life? Maybe today you need to concentrate your, consecrate your life to him. Say, Lord, here's my life. Take it. Father, we love you.
I pray that you'd have your will and way in this invitation now. I pray you'd be glorified and magnified in every heart and every life. If there is one this today that is not saved, we pray that the Spirit of God would convict their heart, save them. And I pray for your people this morning that you would challenge them to live closer to you, to get ready for your coming. Whether we're ready or not, you're coming. Could be today, it could be tomorrow, but we know you're coming. And even so, come, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a couple more minutes and talk to the Lord. As a preacher was preaching here this morning, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. He was the bridegroom. The question needs to be asked. If you're not saved, you need to get that. But if you're a child of God in here, have you made the Lord your Lord? Have you chosen to say, you know, I need to give everything to the Lord? And I know there's a lot of choices that have made in life. And there are times, and especially as God's children, where if you're not careful, you start sliding away a little bit or you allow the world to get in a little bit too much. And you, you start losing your happiness, your joy. You realize there's something missing that's important. And it just might be the power of God in your life. The presence of the Lord is your friend. If you're in here today, maybe you're a Christian, but you've just been holding back. You're not where you should be. Why don't you choose today to draw close to the Lord? Make it a decision of saying, you know, I just need to get back in or get in closer. Let's take a minute and talk to the Lord. Praise the Lord. At this time, um, we're going to take up a love offering for the Sassers. This is to help them and, and certainly help support them. They're full time on, a, on service for the Lord, and we want to be a blessing to them. So if whatever you can give, you can give. And um, if you're visiting with us, we're not here to take your money. We just want most of it, not all of it. No, just kidding. Amen. Um, just want to be a blessing to the Sassers. So if you'd like to give, please do. Um, they're going to be with us through Wednesday. Um, I do want you to come back and don't miss tonight for the Passover Seder. You really don't want to miss that because I'm telling you, it really will really teach you something how it was definitely the Lord was the Messiah. Amen. So let's do this. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to take up the offering and then we'll close. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for today, and I thank you again, Lord, just for being here in your presence, and thank you for Lord Brother Sasser and sending him and his wife, and Lord, just, Lord, so much wisdom and many things, Lord, that we can learn, and I thank you for that. But I pray that each one of us, Lord, will take heed to your word and the preaching of your word that will, Lord, make changes in our life, Lord. We should always leave, Lord, the house of God different, change better than when we walked in. And I pray that you'd be with each person here today. And Lord, as we take up this offering, I pray that it'll be a blessing, Lord, for him and his family, that it'll go a long ways for the furtherance of the gospel. Father, we do love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
to stand to your feet. What a blessing it is to be in the Lord's house today. I want you to enjoy the afternoon. It's nice and beautiful out there. But come on back tonight. Amen. Just at 5 o'clock, come on back. I guarantee you, you won't regret it. You'll have a great time, learn some things. And then remember, plan Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I keep saying that. I don't do that just because we're having a meeting. I really believe it can be a big help for you um, and certainly for others as well. There's a lot that you can learn through this. Amen. But thank you again for coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do love you. We thank you, Lord, for being in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us here this morning. And I do pray that you help all of us, Lord, to leave here today, Lord, full. Lord, knowing that we got something from you and that we can, Lord, utilize it in our life to be able to reach more people for you. And I just ask that you bless each person, give them safe travels home. And, Lord, we look forward to the rest of this meeting, Lord, this week. And I, I pray that you continue to work, Lord, in our hearts. And we love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for, again for coming. We'll talk to you tonight.